I managed to make it. My doctor surprised a uh, flu shot on me this morning. So about an hour ago, I was dead to the world. And I took my laptop on the way up here, so he almost uh, had zero presentations for the TV. <laughs> um, but it functioned. So. Okay, I'm Rob Kaufman. I'm going to be t talking about uh, MySQL S&M. Uh, you can see my email address is rob at notshade.com, and my blog is also at notshade.com. It's kind of a shame that Matt Amanetti won't be joining us this evening, because I gave him a lot of crap about this talk, and now he's got to come up with something sexier than S&M. <laughs> so, we're going to be talking about slave and master um, database replication. Now, not the most exciting of topics under most normal situations, but definitely part of my goal in life is never to be woken up at 2 in the morning by my servers again. And uh, being able to sleep through the night is pretty awesome, and this is one of the pieces that allows me to do that. So, what is master-slave replication? Well, master-slave replication is where you have one database, the master, that does all of the writing, so none of the other database instances, that they all contain the same data, but none of the other database instances are allowed to write in new data. They only read from the master and they just contain a copy, so you can do selects and um, you know look up information and check out join tables and all that stuff, but you can't do updates or inserts or deletes from the place. So, um, what basically the slaves just repeat what the master tells them. This is kind of a graphical example of what that might look, what a setup like that might look like. Um, the arrows here show the direction of data. So, for instance, the app servers would send data to the master, and the master would then, you know, spread that data out so that the slaves are identical to it. And then they would, your apps would then read from those slaves so that the master's not burdened with the reading tasks. So why would you bother with the master-slave setup? Well, one of the things you get is redundancy. If your database server, master server goes down, any of those slaves can become the master at any time. You can set them up um, to auto failover, or what a lot of people do is just set off an alarm and do a manual failover. Um, this is a great thing, uh, especially if you take the extra time and set up an auto failover, because then if someone comes by and unplugs your database server, your site doesn't go down. Or if the hard drive crashes on your master server, you don't, you know, spend three or four days crying while you try and rebuild. Um, it's also used for efficiency cases. Um, things like Wikipedia where you're getting millions of reads for every write that happens to your database. This sort of, you know, distributing of the reads is very efficient, it's very cheap, and it gives you the ability to distribute that load over a whole bunch of systems for very little overhead. Um, and it doesn't slow down the writing process too much. So why you wouldn't why wouldn't you want a system like this? Well, the drawbacks are that first of all, it's important to note that a master slave system is not a backup. Um, and really if you you need to still back up your data. It's very important because any time you do a write to that master, you can still blow away important stuff. You can still very easily wipe your entire database. You can, you know, it's it's just really simple to uh, have problems that you still need that backup for. Um, the other thing that this where you run into problems with the master slave situation is a lot of times your application will be write bound. For instance. If you're a social networking app, well, then it's all about creating content, which is right to the database. Um, and a large quantity of today's new and up-and-coming web apps are 
more evenly balanced read and write than the traditional database app. Um, there's still a huge place for master-slave setups in the world today, you know, things like Wikipedia or um, maybe a, a sales database where you very, ro uh, very rarely update the catalog of what's for sale, but people are coming through and you know, viewing those items regularly. Um, but more and more of our applications are much more even in the number of writes versus the number of reads. So let's talk about how we would do this with MySQL. Uh, MySQL has masters and slaves concept built right into it. Um, you first step is you create a slave user. It, you can use any user of the MySQL database, but it's a good idea to grant only replication slave and no other permission to your slaves um, and have a separate user just for that one path. Um, the biggest reason is the you know, slave pass here, that password, is kept in clear text in the configuration file on your server. So, you know, it's a root read only file, but still, it's there in plain text, it's not encrypted in any way, so you really only want it to be able to read your data and not be able to, you know, delete all from your database. Um, and then the other steps here are going to be, I'm going to show you configuring the master and the slave, and then copying the data for the initial population. Um, on MySQL, there are MyIsom tables and NODB tables. With MyIsom tables, the potential for locking is greater, and the locks last a longer period of time. There are more operations that require you to lock the table. Um, and so the chances of your replication lagging behind are greater. So if you have the ability to use NODB, for doing replication for your tables, it's a better choice in when it comes to the latency between when the master updates and when the slaves get their updates. So here's a example of what you would add to your MySQL configuration, and my.conf is a common name for it. It's also called my.ini. Um, it's stored in about a billion different possible places by the various Linux distributions and Unixes. Um, but it should be logical to your distribution. Um, so I always start out looking in slash etc mysql, but you know it can be in user lib, it can be all kinds of places. So you might have to hunt for the one that you're really using. Um, I highly recommend as you're doing that, if you find ones that are not being used by the mysql server, you either delete them or name them something that shows that they're not being used so that you don't have to do that hunt over and over again. Um, I've seen Ubuntu installs that have no less than six MySQL configuration files, only one of which the server is actually reading and using. Um, anyway, it's a text file. You open it up. There's probably, or almost certainly already a MySQLD block, which is what that square, those square brackets mean. Um, and you just want to make sure that the log bin is being set to some value. Uh, MySQL bin is just a kind of a common name for it. You can call it whatever you want. That's the name of the bin logs that are going to be created by the master server, which is what the slaves will copy down to replicate. And then you need to give the server an ID. Um, it is common for the base configuration when you first compile and install MySQL to have the skip networking directive as one of the lines in this my.conf. Um, you can drive yourself a little nuts trying to figure out why your replication is not working. Um, what skip networking does is it doesn't do, um, it won't listen on any of your network ports, basically. So everything can be configured perfectly, but if MySQL's server isn't set up so that it talks to the network at all, you're not going to get communication back and forth. The second thing you do on the master side is you're going to make a dump of the current status of the um, master database. Here I'm dumping all of the databases, or all of the, yeah, all of the databases that are in my MySQL instance. You can change out all databases to be a list of specific, you know, databases that you want. So if you only want to copy, say, my cool web app, and you don't want to copy, you know, for replication, the secret database, 
you would just list that there instead of all databases. Um, this makes an SQL file that contains directives to recreate this database. Um, this particular line is also very useful in making uh, backups of MySQL tables. So here is the slave setup. I show a log bin here also. You don't have to have it. You don't need to generate the log bin for your slave. I think it's a good idea because you can use that log bin if your database were to become corrupted. Now again, it's only a copy of what's on your master, but if it were to become corrupted, MySQL can sort of straighten itself out a little bit based on the information in these log bin files. Um, opening up and looking at the log bin won't do you any good because it's in binary. Um, that's, it's not SQL that's being outputted to do that. And what MySQL picks up by doing those transfers in binary is massive speed. Um, I've had a database get probably three or four thousand inserts behind its master and go to, you know, clean up, fix whatever little thing is wrong, and then off it goes, and it takes about ten minutes to catch up. Whereas if you were to import all of that as raw SQL, you'd be sitting there looking at probably a good half hour, 45 minutes of turning away, trying to, to catch up with everything that's happened. Um, in the slave file, we have the, we tell it about the master. So we tell it what the host IP address of it is, of the master server that we're going to use is, um, what the user that we set up to do the replication, its password, and its port. There are additional in the MySQL documentation, directives you can put here, you can do um, this communication over SSL if you so choose. It does slow it down pretty substantially, but then it's encrypted end to end. <coughs> so, now that we've got both our systems set up, our master and our slave, we're going to start the slave up. We're going to tell it to skip slave, which means basically don't go to the master right now and ask it what it has for you. But we're going to import all of that data that we copied over from the master. So right at this moment here, after the MySQL um, carrot dump, both databases are the same. You can, while you're fiddling around with setting the slave up, let the master continue to collect data. Because we did Here on our MySQL dump, because we did dash dash master data, it copies what position in the log files it's at when that dump occurred. So it's going to know here, when we start up the slave, that that very moment in time when the dump was created is where we start our copying of data from the master, and we the slave will catch up. I mean, assuming you didn't take three or four days to do this, it'll catch up in minutes. Um, and then these two commands, show slave status and show master status, both allow you to check on the status of your slave and your master. So, tying your slave to the rails. How do, okay, we set up a master database and five or six read databases and we're ready to have our database load distributed nicely. How do we utilize this in Rails? Well, um, relatively new to the scene is a plugin called Master. And I didn't pick the name. It's by Rig Olson. Um, to get it in your Rails app, you can import it with Piston. That same HTTP line can be used with a plugin install if that's your preferred method. Um, and it's really, really dirt simple to set up. This, this plugin is substantially easier to use for this kind of setup than any of the other plugins that we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, all you have to do is go into your database.yaml and make an entry there that is called master database. Normally you have development and test and production. 
or you're going to make another copy of that that's called master database, and the host for that is going to be set to whatever the IP address of your master is in your cluster. Then your production entry is going to be set to point at one of your slaves. Now, you know, and then you save database.yaml and you open up um, config environments production, and you add this little three lines of configure after initialize do, and you set up connection proxy. And that's it. You are now ready to run so that all of your reads will happen from your slave and all of your writes will go to your master. Robbie Russell has an excellent write-up on how to use this. Um, he actually found out about it from Rick before Rick was ready to release it and announced it so that Rick would kind of have to release it. A um, little bit of peer pressure there. And uh, so, like I said, he's got a pretty good walkthrough that talks about the things you can do. Um, as of the original writing of this blog article, there was a problem with observers and using this scheme that has been resolved. And um, as far as I know, there aren't any you know, snafus now, and there are several people using it in production. Now, you do have some other options. Like I said, that plugin is relatively new. You can see there that the blog entry is from November of this last year. So, you know, that's not utterly bleeding edge, but it's still a little more bleeding edge than a lot of people are comfortable, especially since, by definition, we're talking about a very large production environment. You might want to be a little more conservative. Um, there's a plugin called Active Delegate. Really, it's by Robbie Russell. Um, he started down this path and then realized that Rick had a much better solution and has basically abandoned the path. So there isn't a lot of value, I don't think, in trying to figure out Active Delegate and utilizing it. Because I don't imagine, unless there's some thing about it that's really attractive to you, it does require more setup and more code change, it, it's just likely to die off because it's not really, it doesn't solve an itch that the other doesn't. Uh, Dr. Nick has brought us Magic Multi Connections as part of his Magic Model collection. Um, he's got a good write up on how to use it. This gem, yeah, it's basically it's a gem that you can use to handle master slave setups. Um, it also is a capable of doing uh, data partitioning among multiple databases. So, for instance, if you wanted to have, you know, half your tables in uh, Postgres and half your tables in MySQL because you don't like sleeping and you just want to worry all the time about what's going on, um, or because you have to, then it would be able to do that. And you wouldn't have access to the Postgres data from the MySQL side, but you could just say, you know, model people and model admin live in this Postgres database and the models, um, blog posts and um, comments live in the separate database. So Dr. Nick admits that there are some problems with this plugin on his, on the website for it. Um, I did not get a chance to dig through the mailing list and figure out what those problems are, but I just saw that there was a statement there that says, hey, some people have had problems with this, and I don't know what it is, any more about it than that. So if you're going to go this route, you want to investigate that and see, you know, why that little disclaimer is there. Another plugin is Access Read Onlyable. Um, it's from the team at Revolution Health. Um, I think at most recent count, Revolution Health has the largest lines of code Rails app that's out there. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that's still true. They've been a pretty good sized team that's been working for a really long time now. And uh, we've seen a lot of good plugins and stuff come out of that. Um, so, and they're using this access read only in their production environment, which is a pretty substantial deployment of Rails. Um, it didn't look like it had a particularly large additional following, but it may just be that that, act, that, that mailing list is quiet because it's really easy to use. I don't know. Um, it does take substantially more setup than the mathematicism I showed you earlier. Yes, Patrick.
Uh-huh. Uh, so it's possible that whoever was maintaining that is no longer there. I, I don't know. Um, the uh, last one here is uh, Dynamic Database Changer. And Dynamic Database Changer is a little bit different than these other plugins because it provides you a form of load balancing. So what it does is it says, um, I can understand six slaves, and I will, every time you want to do a read, distribute it randomly to one of those slaves. Um, there is an article on how to set it up with Master Master, which is what I'm going to show you next, um, so that it's distributing among a Master Master relationship, and it's load balancing amongst those databases. Um, however, there is no failover, so you don't get an automatic, oh, you know, one of my slaves went down and everything just happens fine, it'll still, load will still be sent to that dead box. So maybe one in, you know, five queries will fail, or one in 20 queries will fail. To me, that's a real danger of the load balancing concept, is you've added yet another sort of randomness every transaction, and that could potentially come back and really bite you when you're trying to debug it. So now we're going to talk about master-master replication. And this, once I've scaled up past one database, is gold to me. This is what I use when the time comes to say one database server, no matter how much memory we stuff in there, just isn't cutting it anymore. We need to go to a couple. What master-master replication is, sometimes called multi-master replication, is a chain or a circle of master databases that each master talks is the slave of the next master down the line. So it's basically like a giant game of telephone. Master 1 tells Master 2 everything it knows, Master 2 tells Master 3 everything it knows, and all the way around the circle. Um, this setup can be mixed in with a master-slave architecture. So if you're talking about a really huge number of queries or maybe really time-consuming queries, you can have a cluster of master servers, each one that has an additional cluster of read-only slaves. This is a diagram of what that might look like. I kind of wish I hadn't used blue here. But that's the way life goes. Um, so, the three kind of black squiggles on those blue uh, cylinders say Master 1, Master 2, and Master 3. And um, we see here that the data is, you know, Master 1 is sending data to Master 2, Master... Actually, in this diagram, Master 1 is sending data to Master 3, and Master 3 is sending data to Master 2. Um, I do recommend that you don't use numbers, that you give them unique names, because it's really confusing when you're talking about them. Um, I did it here for the sake of trying to be as clear as possible about what I'm talking about, and you can see that that didn't work. Um, I don't know, I, I like having some sort of tangible naming convention for my servers, just because it gives them a little bit of personality, and more than that, it really helps when you're trying to communicate with someone else, because it's much easier to keep straight which boxes which that way. So why have a master-master setup? Well, again, we get redundancy. We have hot spares of our data. Um, in the setup I showed you before, each app server speaks to a different master. And so if any one of the um, app servers goes down, you still have a functioning web app. If any one of the databases server masters goes down, you still have a functioning web app. That can be a really slick setup because now you've got redundancy in sort of a um, like a column effect. Any one of thing in the column can go down, and you still have a working web application. Um, however, if one of the masters goes down, the the next master in the chain no longer gets updated. So if master one in our diagram goes down and new data comes into master three, it will get sent to master two. And then master, if master two gets new data, 
it will try and send it to master one and that will fail and then master three will never hear about it because of that until someone goes in and says okay hey master three stop trying to talk to master one it's gone just talk to master two and then it kind of closes the loop does that make sense so it's, it's again like a game of telephone if someone doesn't relay the message the message doesn't keep going around it stops there and all the messages pile up in the one that's, that's down This is a very efficient, a very efficient system for a pretty substantially scaled up Rails app. Um, the MySQL guys claim that this breaks down once you get about above about 10 instances. Basically, it takes so long for the message to get all the way around the loop that you get a noticeable latency of a measurable amount. Um, with gigabit connections and five servers in the loop it is impossible to see them get behind. So the polling on my terminal isn't fast enough to catch them being delayed as I'm writing to them. So, and on front of those, I'm putting a full, you know, as many mongrels as I can get on each one of those boxes, and on front of that, I'm getting putting as much web traffic as I can that, you know, that those mongrels will handle, and I'm still, like I said, the polling on the terminal, I don't see any latency here. It's a single SQL command to make that change. And so um, you can basically set up any sort of monitoring that sees, oh, hey, this one's down, there's a problem, and just does the rerouting for you automatically by just sending that one little command. Um, and uh, there are a couple pieces of software that do things like that for you that we'll get to in a few slides. Um, but, but yes, it is arguable that that should be built in. And the MySQL guys will say, and for that, you can see our, our uh, marketing department and they will be happy to hook you up with the you know, additional services that we provide. Um, but truthfully, it's easy enough to set something up and there are several, like I said, good open source solutions to it that you don't really have to feel that pain. Um, one of the things that is scary about doing this is you know, because you can get behind, you know, what happens if you get behind? Well, really, nothing bad happens if you get behind. Um, it catches up really fast, as long as you know about it. Um, and it, again, it's going to depend on your application. So, here's the why not slide. Again, not a backup, because you can drop tables and they will just be gone way faster than you can panic and stop the slave. Way faster. Um, I thought that maybe if I hooked up a big, you know, one of those easy buttons to a USB port, if I could hit it fast enough once I screwed up, no. So, um, the other thing is it can get behind. And so, if I was doing, say, a Wikipedia site or something else that it didn't matter whether the data that I was showing a user was stale by a couple minutes, even, then I wouldn't hesitate to use this. If I was in danger of selling the same product twice, you know, the same single individual thing twice, you know, if I was doing eBay, where those last few seconds of the auction are utterly crucial, you could get so hosed, right, doing this, doing this because of the time, right? But if you, when you stop and think about it, for most applications, for most of the web apps up there, this isn't an issue. You're not in danger of, you know, double booking something or double selling something and so that tiny little delay you know whether you really see the latest comment from your friend or the comments as of you know two seconds ago is not a make or break um, the things that can cause that latency is if one of the DB instance goes down um, network latency if someone hooks up a bunch of Windows server or Windows boxes that are unprotected and full of viruses and trojans to your production network, it can bog down the network bad enough that the latency will go up and your plays will get behind. Um, and yes, I'm speaking from experience. Um, the uh, other thing is, if somehow your traffic load is coming in fast enough. 
um, which you can simulate pretty easily with Apache Bench. You know, just totally pounding your database with writes or uploading, you know, huge chunks of data over a gigabit connection. You can generate enough traffic that eventually the DB will get, the DB round robining will get backed up. But, again, the way I've managed to simulate that is by either going through localhost or being connected via a gigabit LAN. Um, I wasn't able to do it if my connection to the servers was over a hundred megabit per second connection. So it isn't until you jump up to that next tenfold speed increase that you're really able to pound it hard enough. And if any of you guys have figured out how to pull that kind of speed down off the web, you know, let me know. That'd be awesome. So how do we do this? Well, really, what we're going to do is set up a master and set up a slave. And then we're going to go and tell that master, oh, by the way, you're the slave of your slave. Must making a little two-server loop. Okay? So, again, we create a user, just like we did in the first example. And we go ahead and we dump out all our data um, with the master data. Master 1's configuration. Um, here we're adding the log bin like we did before. We're saying log slave updates. What log slave updates that means is that if server 1 tells server 2, hey, make this update, server 2, by default, won't log to its bin file that it made the update because it heard about it from somebody else. Well, if there's another server in that chain that needs to know about that, we have to log it to our bin file, and that's what that command does. Uh, replicate same server ID equals zero is very important because otherwise what will happen is server one will tell server two, hey, I made this update. Server two will tell server three. Server three goes back and it tells server one, which then makes the update again, thus creating an infinite loop um, and destroying data. Uh, server ID, this unique number, um, each server in your cluster has to have a unique server ID number. Um, then the hosts, you know, this, this master block here that gives us information on how we're going to talk to our master. And now we add the magic ingredient down here at the bottom, auto increment increment, which is a great renamed variable, and auto increment offset. Basically, the problem is you've got these unique IDs. And if master one gets a new record, it says, okay, the next ID I can give it is five, so I'm going to give it five. And if at the same time master two were to get a new record, it would say, hey, the next ID I have open is five, and it would give it five, two. Now you have two items, both with the same unique ID, which is thus not unique, and going to cause havoc. What we do to get around that problem is we say every time you want to get a unique ID, you're going to go to the last unique ID and add 10. And then you're going to use your offset. So master one's IDs, you know, if records created by master one will have the IDs 1, 11, 21, 31, 41, and so on. If we set the increment to be 5, then it would be 1, 6, 12, much harder to keep track of. I recommend it. Besides, we already said we're not going to try and expand this cluster out past 10. So it's a nice, easy thing to ca calculate, easy thing to think about. Um, if you need to do counts on numbers of records created by just one server, you can still do that very easily this way. I highly advise that the auto increment offset be set to the same as the server ID. So that all of the ones that all of the records created that end in one can be instantly traced back to server ID one. It's just one less translation you have to mentally make when you're trying to figure out how the heck something happened. Because we're doing both masters, the two master configuration files are incredibly similar. The two key differences here 
are the server ID is 2, and the increment is offset is 2. And yet, if you set the increment offset to be the same on two masters, it does just roll right over their unique IDs and cause everything to come crashing down around you. Yes? So if you're generating some other form of UID? Yes. No. Because you're not... It, basically, what this solves is the auto-increment issue. If you're not relying on auto-increment at all to do your magic, then it doesn't... You're, you're trying to prevent primary key conflict, and so what you're saying is another way of getting around the same problem. And then these last two lines here, just gone, they still have to have unique server ID. Okay, so we've got our two servers set up. We import the data from master1 into master2, and we tell it, hey, you're a slave of master1, get to work. Um, we can see now what its status is. How far along its own binary log is it by doing um, this show master status command. And I think I'm going to break out here and show you what that command output looks like. Hey, look, I am. We see that the server charcoal here. No. Yeah, we can see. We see that the server charcoal here has is writing into the the bin file charcoal dash bin. They get numbers uniquely added to the end of them. MySQL just completely takes care of that. So, for instance, in the line that says MySQL bin in our configuration, this one says charcoal bin. So that's the name of that server. And we see that right now it's writing that file busily, and that is that position. Uh, 34871. So we write those two things down. We go back to our first box here and we tell it, okay, you know what the login for your master is, you know, you know, the password and the port and all that good stuff. Now what you need to know is which of these numerically tagged log files is master2 currently working on and at what position is it that I want you to start copying everything that gets inserted into it. Does that make sense? Okay. And then we start up master1 as the slave of master2. We've closed our loop and we're off and running. Again, how do we do this in Rails? Well, it turns out that we set up the master master replication. We point our various application servers two different masters, and we're done. We now have this database cluster that we can throw data at it, we can delete stuff, we can select from any one of the things in our chain, and the result will be the same, and all of them will continue to be the same. So, if you just want a hot spare, this is a fantastic way to have a simple hot spare. If you have, you know, multiple application servers, and you want them pointed at different database servers, then you can set it up this way and if, you know, you're going to have the data you want where you want it at any point. Um, one of the things that can be really great about this is you can set a database instance maybe on a little bit slower box um, off to the side using this master master replication and say, okay guys, you know, here's where you do your business queries. Those great tip table building giant queries that slow down everything. And let me have this other, well, maybe a little faster, maybe a little cleaner server over here that does all of the client responses so that, you know, marketing can go in and see how they're trending without slowing down the main site. Okay, because this isn't complicated enough, we're going to talk about load balancing. There are two ways, well, there are multiple ways. There are many ways. Any TCP IP load balancer, including hardware load balancers, can do this job. 
because you're just talking over TCIP to the various MySQL servers. However, by using something that knows what, you know, that was written explicitly for the purpose of being an SQL proxy, you get some benefits that you won't get just with the raw TCP IP load balancer. These systems work to go in front of either a master slave or a master master. Um, both of them set up a new um, either IP address or socket that you connect your Rails app to or whatever kind of application you have that talks to this database. You just basically say, um, that production block in your um, database.yaml file would now point to the proxy, this relay, instead of pointing to the actual database instance itself. Okay? SQL relay, is, again, it, it says up there, it's solid, well-tested solution, it's been around a while. Um, it is a database agnostic solution. Um, it does have to have a driver for whatever database you're using, but the driver support is relatively complete, um, including Oracle and Microsoft SQL. Um, it has Postgres support, which I'm not clear on. Well, I guess the master slave, that would be useful. Um, and MySQL support. Um, SQL Relay knows if one of the instances that it is relaying for is down and will redistribute the load amongst the existing instances. It won't go start up your secret backup database server, okay, and move stuff over to there. It's not a true failover in that sense, but for all practical purposes, your site might be a little bit slower. If you're not running at the absolute max load you can possibly put on your boxes, you're going to be able to survive the night, come in in the morning, fix what's wrong, and move on with life. MySQL Relay is way more different than SQL Relay than its name would imply. Um, it's a relatively new project. Um, it was kind of a big deal in the summer of this last year. Um, it is MySQL specific. It has a whole slew of functionality besides load balancing and failover support. Um, it includes a Lua parsing engine, so you can write um, like translations and do um, something very similar to Apache's mod rewrite to the incoming queries and the outgoing results, if you so choose. Um, which there are, like I said, a whole bunch of possible applications for that are kind of beyond, way beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. Okay. Because you've got this data flowing around in this nice circle or distributing out to these slaves, you need to know when that communication stops and either automatically fix it or you need to um, be able to alert the developer so it's someone, a human being can look at it and see what's wrong. Um, Moonin is a server monitor written in Perl. Um, there's monitoring scripts and statistics gathering scripts for all kinds of different functionality. They're relatively easy to write. This link here takes you to one that explicitly will monitor the status of, of your MySQL slaves. Um, and don't let the word slave there fool you. In a master-master replication, it's the slaves that get behind. Okay? Um, and so it can send you an email. It can trigger a script. It can do all kinds of things when it sees that number go up above some threshold that you set. Um, I set mine to two seconds, and it only ever went off when something was really wrong. I didn't get a bunch of false positives that way, even under heavy load. Um, there's something out there called MySQL Master Master. It's a Google Code project. Um, it looks like it handles the automatic failover portion of the show for you. I don't know. I haven't set one of these up since I became aware of it. Um, it's something that I'd love to investigate if someone else does and can tell me that I'm totally wrong on its purpose or that I'm right on its purpose. That would be fantastic. So if you're going this route, it's probably something to look into. Okay, so 
you got an email that says, hey, the slave number three is no longer receiving updates or has gotten stuck. Why? Most of the time, um, the bin log will get off by one on a conservative way. So it will think the next transaction is an insert even though it's already done that insert um, because halfway through doing the process, the power shut off on that machine or the you know something went wrong with MySQL was killed by the root admin or something. Okay, that process got hung up right at that moment in between when it says, hey, I'm about to do this, you know, I've you know completed the transaction, now I'm moving on to the next step in the binary log. Okay? Um, fixing it is simply a matter of going into the slave that's that's broken and telling it, okay, stop trying to be a slave for a second. In your binary log, move forward one. If it's an update or an insert, you have to tell it to move forward two because that's two steps in MySQL um, underneath the hood logic. And then after you do that, start up the slave again and you should be off and running. Okay? Um, if something's gone really, really badly wrong and you know it, you can set the value of get counter to be more than one. I really advise against using three here. One is good, two is good, any more than that, and it's a real problem. If I know the very next thing, the thing that it's stuck on is an insert, I'll put two because I can put one, I can start the slave, and it'll tell me it's broken again immediately, and then I can put another one, and I'm, I'm back in business, or I can just say two in the beginning. However, if I say three or more, then it's just going to skip some arbitrary, you know, that specific number of instructions in the binary log. And it's quite a bit of work to translate the binary log into anything that makes any sense to you as a human. So most of the time, you just kind of walk through and see, okay, I see that line, I see the database is really okay, we don't need to do it, skip over it. So it's kind of a one at a time sort of deal. Um, and again, the main cause is just being off by one instruction. So most of the time, you look, you look, you see, hey, they wanted to change their name to Albert. The name is Albert. Okay, don't need to do that. Every once in a while, you can actually get ahead. Um, I have seen this on a disk full issue. So a box under heavy load with a log file that goes spooling off or some other reason that the disk hard drive gets completely 100% full. Um, it is possible for this to happen. Like I said, I've only seen it once, and I've done a pretty, you know, about a year and a half now, almost two years of running this kind of setup under heavy load. Um, but there are instructions for fixing it. Once you figure out what's going on, you can tell it, hey, I really want you to go to this position in the relay log. Okay? and go back and you think you've done those steps but you didn't really do them so go back and do it right now. You do have to clear off space on the disk before you do this or it doesn't help anything. And that's kind of it. Um, thanks to Robbie Russell and Dr. Nick, they've both done quite a bit of work in the master-slave kind of architecture. Um, it's pretty clear that they've had at least one or two clients that have needed this functionality and they've taken that extra little bit of time to give back all our hardwood knowledge to the world, which is pretty awesome. Um, there's a site called Rails Magnet that's relatively new. Um, I think it came up in November, and I can't for the life of me see who it's by. There's no about on it that I've been able to find. But it's got really great content, including an excellent little synopsis of all the plugins that I talked about up in the um, master slave section and links to them and links to examples. Um, and then, of course, MySQL, um, there are, they don't do everything right, but this is one thing that they've got set up in a way that is really usable. It isn't insane to try and set it up. It isn't some you know third-party hack. It's built right into the database. It's pretty darn helpful. And uh, I'll link to the main Moonin website because, you know, they're always out there watching my back. I'd love 
have Moonin that wasn't in Pearl. But, you know, it's there and I haven't had time to write it in Ruby yet, so, you know, so good. And do we have any questions? That concludes this episode of the SD.RB podcast. See you next time.